Well, I was waiting because technically I haven't spoken to this group yet. Uh, I thought maybe Mark Thornton or somebody would show up, but apparently I'm, I don't need any introduction. And, uh, <laughs> you guys, my reputation precedes me. Let me, uh, so I, I'm Robert Murphy, for those of you who don't know me, and I uh, was a student at Mises U for a, f a few years and then went, went back uh, and now I'm, I'm teaching here, obviously. So if this is something you're interested in, I just want to uh, encourage you to, to continue with this path uh, because several of the faculty were themselves uh, attendees at Mises University. Also, just a preliminary remark, let me apologize. I know some of you were disappointed. I had uh, told people that I would go to the Ale House last night. We would do an encore karaoke presentation. I just want to explain what happened. So it was last night, you know, we had the, the debate between Walter Block and Gary North fresh in my mind. I left the hotel and I spent three hours trying to get to the Ale House without using government roads. And I just, I couldn't do it. So. All right, so why don't we go ahead and get started here. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll try to leave time at the end for your questions, but there's a lot of material I packed in here, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I'm gonna actually zip through this stuff to make sure I cover everything. Also, again, last disclaimer, this, I'm not gonna get too technical on this stuff, so for those of you who are like grad students in economics, some of this might seem you know, too superficial for you, but there's a wide audience here, and we don't wanna leave some people behind, so obviously, if you have questions about these things and wanna get more deeply into it, just talk to me afterward. Okay, so first of all, the bad teacher's account, and what I mean here is the account of the Great Depression you would get from your, your teacher who's bad, and of course it's a pun. Uh, basically, anytime you can put Cameron Diaz in a PowerPoint, you do it, right? So that's... <laughs> all right, so, so again, the, what I mean though here is like this is the version of the Great Depression that I heard growing up, not from anyone that looked like Cameron Diaz in my classes, but here is uh, sorts of things. So they say, okay, the 29 stock market crash was caused by unregulated margin trading, right? That we had pure laissez-faire capitalism in the 1920s. We didn't have the SEC. We didn't have all of these wise regulatory uh, safeguards that were put in place during the New Deal. And that's why you just had this crazy uh, wildcat free market system. People could even do stuff like borrow money to then go speculate in the stock markets. They said that's what pushed up the stock market and there was the crash. Then they say, now why did the stock market crash of 29 turn into the Great Depression? Oh, it's because we had this guy in office, Herbert Hoover, who was a dogmatic, laissez-faire guy, and he just sat back and let the economy implode because he had these odd philosophical views about the role of the federal government, and thank goodness you know, we don't have a guy like that in the White House anymore that we've you know, since progressed, but that's, this is the standard view you would get. And then when they say, okay, well then how did we get out of the Great Depression? There's two theories that are somewhat related. They'll say, oh, it's well, because FDR came in, and thank goodness, you know, the public demanded that somebody in the White House do something. They threw out that do-nothing reactionary. Herbert Hoover brought in FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he you know, instituted the New Deal, and also then later on it was World War II that got us out. So some people say both of those things. Now, and also I should mention this issue of World War II, if, if you're talking to someone who's like a right-wing conservative, and conservative in the terms of the current American popular landscape. So, you know, people like Rush Limbaugh, that, that's what I mean by conservative. Uh, they might say, no, no, it wasn't the New Deal that got us out of the Depression, it was World War II. All right, and so that, those will try to d deny the accolades to FDR because that's clearly, in their mind, big government interventionism. But then they'll say, it wasn't big government spending, it was big government spending that did it, right? <laughs> Okay, what about Paul Krugman's account? He said, and by the way, there were plenty of Google image searches that I could have done like a real hit job on with the picture, but I decided to be a nice guy and just put up a standard <laughs> picture. Okay, uh, so he says, when, when Krugman talks about it, he'll do things like complain about the current governors who are cutting their budgets and will say, like have a columns called 50 Herbert Hoovers, meaning if you cut spending in the midst of an economic downturn, you're just like Herbert Hoover, because that's what Hoover did in the 1932 uh, calendar year. Like he tried to push through austerity measures back then. And, and, and that's true insofar as it goes, but we'll see a little bit later that that's very misleading. Okay, and then he also points out that FDR did the same thing in 37. His advisors were very concerned about the budget deficit, the federal budget deficit. And so they tried to uh, reduce spending and raise tax revenue. And then you had a, uh, you know, the, a, a sharp downturn in the economy, even though there had been a sort of a, a recovery in between. All right, so, the, so Krugman's point is a good Keynesian is, look at 
The numbers don't lie, folks. The reason uh, the economy was so awful in the 1930s is that you had these people get the crazy idea that you want to have uh, you know, a balanced budget during a downturn when we all know M Macro 101 says if you have a downturn, that's when the government ought to run deficits. Uh, he also says the con conventional monetary policy was hindered by what's called the liquidity trap and the gold standard. So that, and again, I got to be real, you know, dumb this down because I don't know the background of people. So what does he mean when he says these things? What, what he's talking about is in standard uh, Keynesian, in the standard Keynesian framework, you actually don't have to just run big budget deficits every time there's a recession, right? That, that's what some people think, but the modern Keynesians, at least in principle, don't believe that. That they say, no, normally all that has to happen is the Fed cuts interest rates, and then that will stimulate investment spending, and that should fill the, and, and consumers will borrow and spend more at lower interest rates, and that's how you make sure that aggregate demand is big enough to ensure full employment. But he says that doesn't work if you butt up against the 0% lower bound on interest rates, right? That you can't, the Fed can't, no matter how much money it creates, how many assets it buys, the Fed can't push nominal interest rates, nominal meaning the actual market rate you can't push that below 0% because people would just sit on cash. Why would you lend money at a negative nominal interest rate? If, you know, why would I lend $100 to get 99 back next year? That's crazy. I would just sit on the 100 and do better. So the point is if, if the market clearing rate, if the economy is so depressed that the market clearing rate that would, would ensure full employment is like negative 2%, just because the way you draw the curves, it could happen to be negative 2%, then monetary policy, at least conventional monetary policy, doesn't work because the Fed can't push lower, and that's when you have the role for the government to come in and run big deficits. All right, so that's what he thinks was true in the early 1930s and what he thinks is true right now. Okay, and then when he gets more specific about what was it about the 1930s and what is it today that is causing this huge shortfall in aggregate demand, and why is it taking so long for the economy to heal itself because the policymakers, in his view, were doing the wrong thing in the early 30s, just like they're doing the wrong thing now. But you know, we're a little bit more enlightened now. We had a, a, a decent stimulus package, but it should have been twice as big. Back then, you know, they didn't do anything nearly uh, correct until World War II came along. So he's saying, but what was it? Why did, the econ why did we need such a massive government intervention back then and now? Why w was the economy left to its own devices so weak? And he says, oh, it's because there was a, a private debt overhang. So the private sector households and, and uh, banks and so forth took on a lot of debt in the late 1920s during that boom. And then when the bottom fell out, their balance sheets were destroyed, right? That they were all heavily in debt. And so they all tried to pay down their debt. And so that, so how do you pay down debt? Well, you s consume less out of your income, right? Whatever your income is, you consume less, you save more. And that's the way you, you pay down your debt if you're an individual. And so the problem is, every, or lots of people are doing that, while at the same time, the, the, the people who, the creditors, the people whose de, who the debts that are being paid off, they're not borrowing more, right? Because that's what you would need in order, or they're not spending more, I should say. So total spending, total aggregate demand uh, is going down from the private sector's perspective. Because again, some people are heavily indebted, they're trying to fix that situation by saving more to paying down their debts. Whereas the people now who are holding that debt and are being paid off, they're not going out and spending it more. They're, still, they're also being cautious. So that, that's the problem. That's where you get this idea that right now Krugman thinks that there's too much savings going on relative to the private sector's intention to invest. So and this ties in with, with uh, this, this issue about the liquidity trap that the, if you just think about what would it mean to say there's, there's too much savings relative to investment opportunities, well, normally the way we would think about it is say, oh, well, then that means, you know, if there's a glut of savings, that means the interest rate's too high, right? The, the higher the interest rate, people save more and they want to borrow and invest less. So if the interest rate drops, that should equate the two. And, and that's what Krugman's point is that, no, the interest rate, even at zero, there's a glut of savings, that there are more people trying to save than want to invest. And so that's why, you know, if only we could push the interest rate negative, but we can't. Also, this issue, I just forgot about the gold standard. The issue there is the Fed had its hands tied in the early 1930s because they couldn't even do unconventional monetary policy. They couldn't you know, just do what we now call quantitative easing and try to do things like that because of the gold standard. That tied their hands. They couldn't inflate too much because then people would just start turning in dollars for gold and 
And, and that was, that's true. That is one thing that Herbert Hoover was pretty staunch about, is he said, we're not going off gold. And it took you know, FDR to do that. Okay, and then uh, Krugman also, though, has explicitly said several times that the Great Depression ended because of the World War II deficit spending. Right? And he has gone so far as to say things along the lines of, you know, it's that, that Hitler got us out of the Depression, you know, because of the threat of Hitler, and, you know, it's, we don't have something like that now, or, you know, let's hope it doesn't take something like that now to, to get us to, to do the right policy now, all right? Okay, uh, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, they have a famous account of the Great Depression. So, again, this is the Milton Friedman, the Chicago School free market guy, but when, when people ask, how are the Austrian school and the Chicago schools different? This is one huge area of disagreement as to what the cause was of the Great Depression. So there's a whole backstory behind this, but what Friedman and Schwartz say is that the Federal Reserve used to have this guy, Benjamin Strong, who was the, the, the governor of the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which at the time was like the de facto head of the whole Federal Reserve. It was a lot more decentralized back then. And so he was the one calling the shots, basically. And he was very good at doing the right thing. He was, in Friedman's view, was a very good modern central banker. But unfortunately, just the quirks of history, he passed away before this. And then, and then his successors were just weren't up to the task. And so in the early 1930s, after this you know, stock market crash, the Fed did not inflate enough. And specifically what happened, sort of a complicated story, but I'll try to give you the basics. It's not... It's not that the Federal Reserve engaged in intentionally contractionary policy. Okay, so you might hear things like, like, like the way you can hear, and this is the way I first picked it up when I was younger, and of course, as a free market person, you want to be able to point to something that the government did to screw up things during the Great Depression, right? I mean, let's just be honest. You want to be able to say, no, no, it wasn't the free market. It was, you know, this government policy. And so when I first heard Friedman's account, I latched onto that because, like, oh, yeah, this is great. This is just what we need rhetorically. Because Friedman was saying the quantity of money fell by one third from 1929 to 1933. And so that's why you saw I had all this massive price deflation and that's what screwed everything up. And that superficially, that makes a lot of sense, right? The, oh my gosh, the Federal Reserve sucked one third of the dollars out of the economy. That's crazy. Why would they do that? And of course, that's going to cause things to get screwed up. Well, we'll see later on. That's not. I, don't, I no longer think that's a good explanation, and I just want to clarify for you guys, it's not that the people running the Fed intentionally destroyed dollars. What happened is the public got panicked. There were bank failures going on in the early 30s, right? People's banks were failing, and this was before FDIC. So if your bank went down, you, you, you as a depositor were like a creditor for a business that went bankrupt. And so you might get some of your money back, but you wouldn't get paid 100 cents on the dollar. It would depend on how many assets the bank had and, you know, when they went through liquidation. So when that starts happening, people panic, and they start, if they get a sense that their own bank might be in trouble, they go to take their money out because they want to be the first one. So you had classic bank runs. And so if you understand how our monetary and banking system work, it's a fractional reserve system. So that means if there's, I'm just making up numbers, let's say there's a million dollars in cash and green pieces of paper in the vault of a, of a bank, well, because of the fractional reserve system, maybe there's $10 million out there in terms of the community, what they think they have in the bank, right? When people look at their checking account balance, or nowadays what we'd say in terms of if you put your ATM card and you see your balance, you know, the community, all the, the bank's customers might think they have $10 million. And the way we compute monetary aggregates like M1 and M2, that counts. It's what you think of as your checking account balance. So now if, that whole, if all the people in the community rush to that bank to take their money out, and the bank gives out a million dollars to the first people that show up, and then it runs out of money, says, sorry, we're out, and the bank goes under, in a sense, $9 million just disappeared, right? Because if people thought they had yesterday $10 million in that bank, they withdrew it. So when the smoke clears, there's now an extra million dollars in green cash in people's wallets, but now the, the rest of those $10 million in checkable deposits is just gone because that bank's bankrupt and no one's bailing it out, so that's it. Okay, so in a sense, so in that experiment there, that, that scenario, M1 and M2 and M3 would have gone, would, would have fallen by $9 million. Okay, so that's, so what happened is that sort of thing was going on and the Fed didn't create enough new green dollar bills to offset that. Okay, so that's, so it is true that the money supply, if you 
measure it in terms of things like M1 or M2 that include total checking account balances, that did fall by a third in the first few years of the Depression, so he's not making that up. But I just want to clarify, it's, it's not that the Fed consciously chose to, to do that, it's just that the public, their demand to hold currency went up and the Fed didn't create enough new money out of thin air to offset that. So Friedman thinks that it was basically the Fed's inaction that made the, the stock market crash turn into the Great Depression. And he also thinks that the reason the stock market crashed was that the Fed uh, tightened in like late, late or mid-1928, and then that's what caused the actual crash in the first place. So he's blaming it on, ironically, tight money. Uh, another thing, just, just so you know, because this is a big issue among modern Friedmanites and uh, what's now called the quasi-monetarists. Again, this is getting a little bit geeky, but if you want to know these things. So there's this group now called the quasi-monetarists, and they point to Milton Friedman as their hero. And their view is, right now, the reason we're in such trouble is that Ben Bernanke has been stingy with monetary policy. They explain the crisis in the fall of 2008 by Ben Bernanke's unwillingness to create money. All right, now, I don't have the graph to show you, but you've seen those, you know, the graphs like this, and then and it shoots way up. And so they're explaining, yeah, the problem is it didn't shoot up, you know, through the roof, literally. Okay, so, and, and what they do is they, and they point to Friedman as an authority on this, and they say, and, and this, this part's true. I mean, Friedman isn't alive now to tell us what he thinks about Bernanke. Incidentally, uh, Anna Schwartz is alive to tell us now, and she has been critical of the rounds of quantitative easing, but in any event, the quasi mantras they say, they quote Friedman explaining this distinction, that normally people think that, oh, when, when there's easy monetary policy, when the, when the central bank is being loose and, and uh, expansionary, they print a bunch of money and that pushes down interest rates. And so people tend to think that low interest rates mean there's easy money, whereas high interest rates are when they tighten up. And so the people nowadays say it's wrong to look at 0% interest rates and say, aha, the Federal Reserve is being very loose. Say, no, it's actually being, or that's consistent with tight mon monetary policy. Because think about it, if it's really tight monetary policy in the midst of an awful economy, well then, people who have money and want to do something with it, they're willing to lend it out at basically zero. Because they don't have attractive investment opportunities because the economy is awful. And since money is so tight, they're not worried about price inflation. So they're willing to lend it out at virtually 0% short term or you know, very low yields, even over five and 10 years. Okay, so they are, the, the modern quasi monetarists are right. Friedman does say stuff like that about the Great Depression and about Japan during its lost decade, just saying that don't be fooled just because there's lo, tip, you know, uh, low interest rates compared to normal times. Don't think that the Fed in the early 30s was engaging in easy money or that Japan was during the, its so-called lost decade. Okay, what about Murray Rothbard's account? <laughs> okay, he says that the Fed created artificial stock market boom in the 20s through you know, the standard Austrian business cycle theory, and that's what caused the 29 crash. So it wasn't the free market, obviously. It was the fact that you had the Fed pumping in money. And as far as, you know, because you say, well, okay, but why do we have the Great Depression then? that there were plenty of panics and depressions with a small d before 1929, and it didn't turn into a decade-long slump, so what was special about this one? And he said, well, what's special is Herbert Hoover, contrary to popular belief, engaged in unprecedented interventions. And so the necessary depression with a small d became what we now refer to as the Great Depression, precisely because of that. All right, so um, I'm gonna, in a little bit, I'm gonna come back and give you some more specifics, but. Rothbard does a great job, and this is coming from his book, America's Great Depression. He does a great job just digging up speeches and things from Hoover, showing I mean, this idea that, that Hoover is a small government laissez-faire uh, ideologue is just, it's crazy. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff. Just to give you an example, I should have dig, dug up the quote, but FDR in the 32 campaign runs on the platform of a balanced budget as opposed to the wild spendthrift Hoover, where he gives speeches to the electorate saying, elect me, Franklin Roosevelt, don't re-elect this crazy guy Hoover because he's reckless with the public's money. You know, I'll have a balanced budget. I mean, so that's just shows you how the, the Keynesian explanation of what happened is crazy. Now, of course, politicians always lie when they're running for election, 
and, and FDR ran bigger deficits than Hoover, but the point is, it, you know, just to be, for him to be able, it was plausible for him to accuse Hoover of big spending because he was a big spender. Okay, what about my account? <laughs> the, uh, so the, mon so the thing that I, I mean, I don't know that I was the first person to discover this stuff, but the, the, the angle that I take on this, just to, to give you some, the background here. So Rothbard's book, America's Great Depression is wonderful in detailing what it, during the Hoover, like the, the, the boom and then the Hoover administration's response, but he stops there. He doesn't talk about the New Deal in that book. And, and he doesn't get into this stuff as far as I can remember. So I, like I said, I'm not saying I'm the first person to invent, to discover this, but as far as I know, I was the one who tied this into the, the Great Depression analysis. Okay, so my point here is, and if you want, afterward, I can tell you guys where to, to go dig this stuff up um, if you want to see the more specifics. But the, if the, the monetarist, if like Milton Friedman, if he's right about why the 1930s were so bad, well, then the 1920s should have been twice as bad. Because in the Depression of 1920 and 21, which many of you may not even have heard of, but yeah, there was a sharp downturn. It was called a depression in 1920 and 21 in the United States. There, what did the Federal Reserve do? They jacked interest rates up to record highs, and the monetary base itself shrank. So in the Great Depression, the monetary base generally grew. It's just it didn't grow enough to offset those bank panics. Whereas in this Depression, the Fed literally intentionally contracted the monetary base and, like I said, jacked interest rates up to what were then record highs, whereas in the Great Depression, they pushed them down to what were, at that point, record lows, interest rates. And... Uh, and also price deflation, like how much the CPI fell, was far stronger in 1920 and 21 than in any 12-month period in the Great Depression. So if, you're, if, you, if your explanation, as Friedman's is, is that, oh, well, there's sticky wages and stuff like that, and so that's why the massive price deflation that was, ne that was made necessary because of the Fed's refusal to inflate enough, well, that screwed everything up. And then you had all kinds of you know, non-market clearing prices going on because they prices and wages needed to fall, but there were institutional rigidities. All right, so that's Friedman's basic story. And I'm saying, well, then how come that didn't happen in 1920 and 21? So there's something else going on besides just, oh, there was deflation happening in the 30s because the deflation was far worse in this period. And yet, as we all know, the 1920s were called the Roaring Twenties. All right, as far as the Keynesians, similar story. They're saying the problem was that Hoover didn't run big enough deficits. And if they, if they know the numbers, they have to say, yeah, he ran deficits, but they weren't big enough, right? So it's kind of like the story now with the stimulus. Yeah, Obama did you know, the stimulus, but it wasn't big enough. It's the same thing. They're going to say Hoover was too stingy. He should have run even bigger deficits. Well, the problem with that is, again, 1920, 21, it's not that the government spent more but insufficiently more. They cut the budget, something like 60% in one year. Right, again, so I don't mean like slow the rate of growth. I mean the absolute number of dollars the federal government spent dropped by 60% in one year, and they kept cutting because this was at the end of World War I. Right? So the government was vastly scaling back its expenditures, coming back from the war. So again, you would think if, if the reason we had the Great Depression is because the Fed wasn't willing to inflate enough and the Treasury wasn't willing to run big enough deficits, well, then how come the 1920s weren't just catastrophically worse, because they did the exact opposite thing according to Friedman and the Keynesians. Okay, the other rhetorical point I like to make about this idea that FDR got us out of the Depression is to say, what would history have to look like for people to conclude that FDR prolonged the Depression? Because right, we'll see in a minute, I mean, this hands down, the Great Depression was the longest, most sluggish recovery from any downturn in U.S. history. So to say FDR got us out of the Depression, I mean, all those people can possibly mean is he was in office during the Depression, and then depending on how you time it, he was in office when we got out of the Depression, so therefore he was responsible. But again, that's not, you know, that's not really, uh, I mean, you could, you could argue that Adolf Hitler got us out of World War II, you know, or something like that. All right, all right what about Bob Higgs' account? Wait for it. All right, some, some of you foreigners don't know what people are chuckling about. It's because that's not Bob Higgs, that's Larry David. <laughs> All 
All right, and some of you Americans would have gotten the joke, but you were unobservant. All right. Um, <laughs> incidentally, if you guys have the uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, I think it's season two, but I might be off by a season or something. You know how you put the DVD in and it just runs on loop in the beginning if you're not playing it? There's one scene where Larry Davis, do, he looks and sounds just like Bob Higgs. It's a, he has like a plumber over his house, and he's going, plumb the depths, got a plumb, plumb the depths of hell. And he sounds just like, just trust me. <laughs> It'll, it'll freak you out. All right. <laughs> okay, regime uncertainty. So this is, uh, and with this, when I say these accounts, I don't mean, of course, that Bob Higgs or I don't go along with the stuff Rothbard said. I'm just trying to break it up to, to show you the various things that these different people stress. Okay, obviously I agree with all the stuff Bob Higgs said and Rothbard said. Uh, regime uncertainty is his, his baby, and he, the point here is he's, there's a, you know, there's an empirical puzzle that during the 1930s, private investment spending is just awful. That in terms of what you would need to spend to maintain the capital stock in its existing form, it, it was too low. Right? So that there was uh, not even enough reinvestment just to maintain the capital structure the way it should have been. So there was, in a sense, capital consumption going on for a long stretch in the 30s. So... That's a puzzle. Why is that? So somebody like Paul Krugman says, well, duh, because demand wasn't there. If you're a business person and people aren't buying your products and you're laying off workers and you're having trouble just you know, getting rid of your inventory, you're not going to go out and spend more to expand your factory. Why would you do that? All right, so that, in Krugman's mind, that's the explanation. What Higgs talks about is this idea of regime uncertainty. And he says that it's because um, the rules kept changing. As this is FDR's New Deal, and right now I don't have time to get into all the things he did, but some of the stuff was, was just shocking. So it's not like, oh, they raised taxes, even though they did do that. That's not the big thing. They just did all sorts of things, like putting in whole codes for individual industries, setting prices. They literally had uh, guys in trench coats going around at night, kicking in doors and, and pulling people out of their offices for working outside of the code, right? Like you were only supposed to work certain hours, and if they caught somebody, like let's say a tailor, sewing a pair of pants at night when he wasn't supposed to be, people could bust down his door with an ax and pull him out and arrest him, okay? I mean, this is stuff that people don't you know, think of, oh, that must happen in a fascist country. Well, this was happening in the United States, and that's not what the you know, standard school teacher is gonna tell you. They're gonna make it sound like, oh, and then we had the New Deal, and it was a government business partnership, and we. You know, people finally decided to take the bull by the horns and get us out of the depression, but this is the kind of stuff that was going on. So the point is, what Higgs is talking about is that the, um, if you're a business person and the rules keep changing, of course you're not going to invest, because for all you know, the government's going to seize your factory the next year. And that's not, that wasn't an idle concern or an idle threat that Higgs points to surveys that were done at the time of business people and there were, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, I have it in my book, but there were plenty of people who thought that FDR was trying to become a dictator. And then it's just, you know, like how now people are, some people are really worried about Obama and, oh, is he a socialist and all that stuff. Well, at the time, that's what people were saying about FDR. And it wasn't, you know, now in retrospect, we know, oh, he wasn't, but remember the kind of stuff he was doing. It wasn't simply that he was doing things like threatening to pack the Supreme Court when they weren't going along with the New Deal and it wasn't just that he was overturning the existing ideas of what the federal government's role in the economy was, but he also was running for a third term, and he kept running for office, right? So that was the first time in U.S. history that you had had a president who was in office more than two terms. So, yeah, it certainly did look like this guy was trying to take over, you know, whether what his ultimate aims were. So you can see that this was a very plausible concern. So that's what, what Higgs' idea of regime uncertainty is, that you're not going to invest a lot and, and put yourself on the line if, for all you know, the United States is literally going to turn into an outright fascist country in the next few years. Okay, and his other big thing is he did a lot of work explaining why World War II military spending did not end the Depression, and I'm going to go over a few, some of that in a little bit here. Okay, let me, so now that I've given you the broad overview of the, of the competing views, let me just supplement that with some more uh, information, and then I'll, I'll leave the rest of the time for your questions at the end. So Herbert Hoover versus FDR. Again, the, the standard view is that these guys were polar opposites, that Herbert Hoover was this dogmatic, laissez-faire reactionary, 
and FDR was this you know, compassionate guy who thought that the, uh, the federal government had a role in, in helping the little guy. Let me, before I get into the, the differences, let me just pause for a minute and just point out, this is something that I like to stress, the standard story doesn't make any sense on the face of it, right? The standard story that you would get from a U.S. history book, if you, you know, you're taking U.S. history in sixth grade or something, says, again, just to repeat it, that the reason we had the Great Depression is you had this wild, unregulated free market, there was a big stock market crash in 29, and then Herbert Hoover just sat back and did nothing. And that's why it just festered and you know, snowballed downward, things just kept getting worse and worse. Workers got laid off, so then, they didn't have money to spend, but then that meant business revenue was down, so they had to lay off more workers, and there was this vicious downward spiral. So, and then finally FDR comes in and turns things around, right? That's the story. So my point is, it doesn't make any sense, because what, even if it were true that Herbert Hoover was a do-nothing guy, so were all of his predecessors, right? The, the standard story doesn't say we had big interventionist guys who had the New Deal in place, and then Herbert Hoover dismantled it. And then that's why we had the Great Depression. No, people, Herbert Hoover was, you know, if it were true that Herbert Hoover did nothing, well, so did all his predecessors, relatively speaking, compared to, you know, FDR and subsequent presidents. So that doesn't really explain why we had the Great Depression in the 1930s. We should have had the Great Depression whenever the first big financial panic hit. Right? So it wasn't that the 1929 stock market crash was the first time you had a big crisis. No, you had plenty of crises and depressions with a small d throughout U.S. history up to that point. So again, it, this, the story on its face doesn't even make sense. But what does make sense is if your explanation is as Rothbard's is, and say, no, what was different, why we had things happen differently in the Great Depression compared to previous ones, is that Herbert Hoover did try to do something. He acted differently from all of his predecessors. And there's tons of quotes from Hoover himself in, in his memoirs and his public speeches Admitting that, saying we charted a new course. You know, we, had to, we were doing things from the White House that had never been attempted before, so we kind of had to wing it. I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but you get the idea that he was talking like that. Okay, so propped up wages and farm prices. That's exactly what FDR did. As far as propping up wages, in particular, Hoover, and I'm, I have a slide, I think the next slide is going to talk about this. Hoover calls in all the big business leaders right after the stock market crash happens. So this is in late 1929. And he tells them, look, don't cut wages. That's the worst thing you can do, right? If we're, right now, people are panicked. I know you guys are panicked. And I know your natural inclination now, because the market just crashed, is for you to clam up to cut expenditures, to start laying off you know, some of your superfluous workers. But he says, just think about it, guys. If you all do that, which is what normally happens during a downturn, then all those workers now aren't going to have any money. And so they're going to stop spending. So you're all just slitting your own throats if you act in your narrow self-interest. you got to think, you know, think in terms of the collective. And so I'm urging you, if you do have to cut back, cut back on your dividend payments, cut back on your profits, but don't lay off workers. Or if you do have to cut back on your uh, you know, wages, don't lay people off. Just cut back their hours you know, across the workforce because then that, you know, that won't really knock out any household and they'll still spend. All right? So that was the sort of thing he did. Now, whether it was because of that or something else, clearly, objectively, the data show that wages fell a lot more slowly in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, than they had during the 1920 and 21 depression. Okay, so as far as an economist trying to explain why did unemployment go up so high in the 1930s, that's, that's what I would say, that you have prices falling, but wages were stuck, and so labor every year kept getting more and more expensive. And so if something's getting more expensive, you buy less of it. So that, that's the explanation. So again, whether the wages were stuck because of Hoover or because of unions or some combination, that's more up in the air. But what's not debatable is that wages were a lot stickier, as, as economists say, in the early 1930s than they had been earlier. And so that's one of the reasons why unemployment went, went up so much, is that the, the labor market was less adaptable. OK, tax hikes and deficits. Um, for this particular presentation, I'm not going to get into these details, but it, they're in my book. The, the tax hikes were shocking uh, of Herbert Hoover and the, the 1932 legislation, and Rothbard does a good job expanding all this. But I mean, it's, it, it, it's really amazing and just how big of a jump in, in the various tax brackets there was. It wasn't like a little two percentage point increase. I mean, there was huge increases. So when Krugman says, oh, the mistake of 1932 that Herbert Hoover did 
was to try to reduce the deficit that's misleading on two accounts. Because for one thing, the deficit went down by a, just a tiny little bit. The, but the real thing is that the lesson isn't, oh, you want to maintain deficits. I think the lesson is don't jack tax rates way up in the middle of a depression because that makes things worse. And they both engaged in public works projects. Okay, so my point is FDR was not qualitatively different from Hoover. And in fact, one of FDR's lieutenants in the late 30s admitted, he said something like, you know, we, we never would have admitted it at the time, but actually everything we did in the New Deal was just an extension of the things that Herbert Hoover had done in his administration. Okay, let me just give you a few examples of what I mean. So this is, this top one, federal spending by fiscal year. And so you can see, it, and really this is like the first one that Hoover has control over. You can see, so that's rising, right, throughout the, the Depression year. So this idea that Hubert Hoover Hoover... You know, he didn't cut spending. At best, as a Keynesian, you could argue that he didn't raise spending enough. And then here, too, you can see the deficit did get big. And part of it was because, yeah, tax revenues were down, but it was also because spending went up. And in part of it, you know, as a share of GDP, the reason it was magnified is because the economy was shrinking. But again, the point here is Hoover was not a, a balanced budget kind of guy. It was the deficit got huge, his advisors started getting panicked, and then they passed a bunch of tax increases in 1932 that actually didn't bring in much more revenue because they destroyed the economy so much that even though the, it was getting taxed at a higher rate, they shrunk the base so much that not that much more revenue came in. Okay, does anyone know what, what that is? Hoover Dam, right? So again, just, just trying to get you to see, wait a minute, is it really true that Herbert Hoover sat in the White House and did nothing? Okay, <laughs> labor unions love Herbert Hoover. The President's Conference has given industrial leaders a new sense of their responsibilities. Never before have they been called upon to act together. So who is that from? Is that from the president's press secretary? No. That was an editorial in the American Federationist, a labor union publication in early January of 1930. Okay, so remember the stock market crash happened in late 1929. Hoover calls in all the big business leaders and tells them, don't act in your narrow self-interest, don't act the way businesses have acted all previous times in U.S. history and want you to behave differently, don't cut wage rates. And labor unions are saying, finally, we got, a, you know, dare I say, a progressive in the White House. All right, so again, this is, the point here is, after the fact, to explain why did things get so bad, we had to come up with this idea of the, you know, cold-blooded Herbert Hoover who hated poor people at the time, they were praising him for doing things differently. It was only, it blew up in their faces and it was the worst depression ever that they said, oh wait, maybe he was a laissez-faire reactionary. All right, so, but if you think, wait a minute, maybe it's because he did everything different and that's why the results were so much different. That makes perfect sense. Okay, as far as this idea about FDR getting us out of the Great Depression, this is what I meant when you say, what would it look like if he prolonged the recovery? What would it look like if the New Deal was awful? Wouldn't it look like this? That you had, so this was the, so it's true, this was bad, and then this one right here, you could, you could fairly blame that on Hoover because uh, you know, FDR, the election was in 32, and then he gets, and in those days the inauguration wasn't in January, it was in March, so you could fairly say, okay, FDR really you know, shouldn't be held responsible for that, Fair, fine. But still, when they say he did a great job, I mean, to come down, what, 1.6 percentage points when it was starting that high, I mean, that's, that's not really a great recovery. And that was coming down and say, yeah, no, things are doing pretty good. But, you know, four years after he was in there, we had the unemployment rate down to 14.3%. That's pretty good. And then, boom, it went back up to 19. And then, uh, uh, so, look, it, it was not until eight years after he's in there that it finally gets below 10%. So this, just in terms of normal recoveries, you had a business cycle, maybe it would take three years if it was a really sluggish one before you were back in you know, full recovery and things were getting back to normal, maybe it was that long. So the point is here, this was just agonizingly slow. So again, what would history have to look like if we thought the New Deal actually made things worse? I submit it would look just like that. Let me just drive the point home, because a lot of people say, well, no, look, he came in, and the unemployment rate was going down, so clearly he was helping, and then again, they, they explain this blip upward by saying, oh, it's because FDR tried to 
balance the budget right here, and so that's why the unemployment rate went up. But the point is, in all previous U.S. presidents, after there was a big downturn and the unemployment rate was really high, it would fall, and it would fall a lot more quickly than that. And so the, the relative comparison isn't to say, oh, if it hadn't been for FDR coming in the office, we would have stayed at 25% unemployment forever. No, the economy in all previous times had eventually recovered within a few years. And so the fact that, that it took much longer and then again jumped back up to 19%, that is very consistent with the claim that the New Deal was hurting things. The other thing that I do in my book is I compare the evolution of the U.S. unemployment rate with the Canadian one. And you can see that the, that the gap between them got bigger under FDR. All right, because, because what FDR's apologists say is, yeah, that took a long time to recover, but look what FDR had to deal with. He came into office with the worst depression in the world history to deal with. So yeah, it was going to take longer to dig out of that than a previous thing. But my point is, okay, but the same is true of Canada, and yet if you track the unemployment rate between the U.S. and Canada during the Hoover administration and then during the FDR administrations, you can see the gap gets bigger, that the U.S. performance relative to Canada becomes worse under FDR. So whether you compare it to the U.S. in earlier depressions or to Canada in the same depression, things were worse under FDR. All right, let me spend a few minutes now talking about this claim that, okay, it wasn't FDR, well, it wasn't the New Deal, it was World War II that got us out of the Depression. So this is drawing heavily on the work that Bob Higgs has done. So there's two main components to that. The first thing is you look at the unemployment rate, and then you can look at the GDP figure. So let's look at the unemployment rate first. So, yeah, on the face of it, it sure does look like they got us, the World War II got us out of there, because here's 1929, the unemployment rate zooms up very high uh, by 33. Then FDR comes in, it does come down up, but then it bumps up again. And you see that we don't really get out of the slump until the 1940s. And if you, you know, look at the time and when did it really start falling, it was right when those, the Japanese, thank goodness, bombed us, right? We finally got policymakers to get the gumption to spend enough money to get us out of this depression. All right, so Bob Higgs has just pointed out, and this is a pretty basic point, that, well, if the way you get the unemployment rate to go down is to take millions of able-bodied men and put them on a ship and send them across the ocean to get shot at, yeah, you can fix the economy, but there, that's the case where maybe the unemployment rate's not really measuring anymore what you think it is. All right, so it's not really that they found all sorts of great job opportunities for these people. They just took them literally against their will and shipped them across the ocean. Right, by the same token right now, I mean, if Obama says, gee, we got this 9.4 or whatever it is percent unemployment, all these millions of people without a job, what do we do if they just took them and, and shipped them off to some island somewhere and they were gone, well, the unemployment rate would go down, right? But you would say that probably isn't curing the unemployment problem. That's not what we mean when we say the, fixing the economy. And the other thing, too, is it's even worse than I'm leading you to believe. You might think that there was a one-for-one -one drop that for every person that they drafted and sent overseas, that the unemployment rolls dropped by one, but it wasn't, it wasn't as good as that. You know, in other words, they drafted and, and shipped overseas more men than, uh, than the, the drop in the unemployment. So what I mean is other people who had been working lost their jobs later so that the ranks of the unemployed you know, filled so they didn't fall as much as you would have thought from the just literal removal of people from the economy. Okay, this one is, is nice too. Okay, so war, is it good for GDP? Well, it sure looks like it. All right, so these are the official GDP figures and these are this is real, right? So this is, in theory, inflation adjusted. So you can see, I don't know if it's hard for you maybe to read these numbers, but this is 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. So you can see the economy is falling in real terms, you know, just crashing in the beginning. Then finally FDR comes in, and things seem to start turning around up, but then there's that downturn in 38 like we know about. But even so, still here, it's just barely, what year is that? That's 38. It's just there it's barely above where it was in 29. So I mean, in terms of historically compared to other business cycles, that's just awful that you could be nine years ahead of the previous peak and you're still just barely getting ahead of that. That's awful. And you see it doesn't really just zoom, zoom up until 45. Well, 44 and 45. Okay, so this of course, these are the, the main war years when there's all the high spending. And then up after the war, 
you have another pretty big crash in terms of real output. All right, so that is, the Keynesians think, come on, you guys are crazy, you, you austerians, you, you people who, who preach fiscal austerity, clearly what got us out of the Great Depression was the big spending of World War II. So what sort of things does Higgs point out about this? Well, one thing is, what if we disaggregate this? So as you know, the GDP figures, the way they compute those is they just measure total spending. So it's the same whether a household spends money on a radio or a business spends money investing in a new factory or if the military spends money buying a tank. So what's interesting, if you disaggregate this into government expenditures and private, look what happens. So you see, so just to make sure, you know, so look at that compared to that. So the, the total is the same as the previous slide. But here what I'm showing you is disaggregating those totals the, the proportion of government spending versus private sector spending. So what you see is, just look at the blue stuff. Yeah, it went down, and then it looked like it was going up, but then, this is right here, what is that? That's 1941. Then when we really get into the depths of World War II and the major spending, private sector output dropped here. It's lower than it was even at the depths of the Great Depression in terms of how much consumption and investment is the private sector getting. And you see the reason the total was so big is the government spending as a share of the economy is just enormous. That's, that year right there, is, I, I think that's gotta be the biggest share of government spending of the, to, to the economy in US history. Right, so that right there should give you a little warning, wait a minute, something's not right here. So in particular, what it is, of course, is that when the government spends a million dollars and they call that output, that's not the same thing as if the private sector spends it, right? That that's not really a measure of output in the same way. Even if you think that the war is, is a worthy effort and they, and they should have been doing that, the point is you don't have a competitive system. The politicians, in the mili you know, giving money to military contractors, they're not as careful with that money because they don't get to keep it if they economize on it. So they're, you know, that's why the Pentagon notoriously overpays for things. And the government in general spends a lot more getting items than what a private business would spend to get items of the same uh, quality. All right, so that's, that's, that's one huge explanation for why those figures are misleading. So as you can see, as, as Higgs points out, he says he, he doesn't date the end of, of the, uh, the Great Depression until 1946. Because there he said, look at the difference between the real, uh, private sector's share of consumption and investment over to 1946, he said that's the biggest increase in the actual production for the private sector in U.S. history that happened in that one year, and yet officially that was a crash, right? Because look, at oh, total GDP went way down. What an awful year that was. But no, everyone could get nylon stockings and, and radios and stuff again that they couldn't have during the war years because of rationing and so forth. All right, another component to all this, so it's even, it's even worse than this leads you to believe, because what was happening during the war years was the Fed was printing money like crazy. So this just gives you, now this is the monetary base, so you can see, okay, it's da -da -da, it goes up and the third is up, comes down, and then look, it just explodes uh, during these war years, and then it levels off. Okay, so what was happening is during the war years, the government was taking a lot of money through taxation, it was taking in a lot of money by borrowing, but also you had you know, through that channel as the, as the Federal Reserve was massively expanding the monetary base and, and buying up government debt. So basically, you threw inflation, that's partly how uh, the huge expenses of World War II are financed. So normally, the way, that would normally, the way you would see that in these figures, these things should be lower because what would normally happen is if the, if the Fed prints up a bunch of money and that's how the government buys stuff, that would push up the price level. And so, yeah, the nominal GDP figures in terms of total expenditures would be going up, but then you'd, you would deflate that because prices were going up. And so, like, just to give you an idea, let's say the Fed doubles the money supply, and so total spending doubles. Well, you wouldn't, so, so GDP, nominal GDP doubles, oh, but if all the prices double too, real GDP would be the same. Okay, that's the idea. So the, the formula isn't completely crazy. They try to correct for inflation. And this, but these figures are supposed to be real. These are adjusted for inflation. So the Keynes are saying, no, no, we took that into account. But Bob Higgs points out, no, you didn't, because during the war years here, there were price controls. So that it was illegal for prices to go up the way they should have 
the government just literally suppressed the price level increase. And so I, when I was doing the book, I called Bob Higgs to double check this. And I said, wait a minute, are you saying they corrected for the fact that there were price controls? You know, in other words, like the CPI, they figured out what would it be if there weren't price controls and you just think that they didn't do a good enough job? Or are you saying they made no adjustment whatsoever? And he said, they made no adjustment whatsoever. All right, so when they call these the real GDP figures during the war years, that's, that's completely bogus. That's like looking at Soviet Union output statistics. That that's, <laughs> it, seriously, I mean, it, the, the, the number, like I say, it's not just that, oh, it's a little bit off because they didn't adjust the way we, they should have. They didn't adjust it at all. They're just plugging in the prices that the government announced. These are the official prices for eggs and nylon stockings and blah, 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 gasoline. Okay, for further reading, uh, this is my book that's available down there. And Bob Higgs did say in the blurb on it that you know, this, is the, this is the best introductions, right? So, and that is what I try to do in this one. If, you're, you, know, if you want to get a, an overview of the various things and see some of the quick statistics, that's what that's good for. Rothbard uh, focuses, like I say, on the, if you want to really see in terms of applying Austrian business cycle theory to the 1920s to see, well, how did the, you know, the Fed increase the money supply and so forth, and then the specific things that Hoover, Hoover did, that's a great one. Uh, this one is interesting, is Lionel Robbins. This is as good, uh, of the four of them, this one is probably the one, you know, the least Austrian, but it's still very Austrian in the sense that he does blame it on central banks. And what's interesting is Robbins points out that the central banks during the 30s were acting differently from all previous crises, that there they were intervening like crazy, they were providing easy credit and he was saying, why are you doing that? You're propping up losers. You're bailing out bankrupt firms that should go under. Right? So it's, it's kind of eerie how similar the debates were back then to what they are now. It, so that, why that's interesting is because that's the opposite of what we hear. We hear now, it's a good thing that Bernanke bailed everybody out and we had TARP because in the 30s they sat back and did nothing and that's why it collapsed. And no, it's the opposite. Ribbons and others at the time were saying in the 30s, why are you guys bailing out all these bankrupt firms? Let them go under, and then we can you know, reallocate resources and get out of this thing. And then, of course, Robert Higgs' book, uh, summarizing some of his... So this is a collection of his essays summarizing some of his work. So when I talk about Higgs' work here, I mean, he had actual you know, peer-reviewed journal articles overturning some of these myths of wartime prosperity. All right? So this is really uh, good stuff that you, know, you could hold up to other academics and say, no, this got into a, a means, this wasn't just like in the QJ or something. I mean, this was in a real journal. So <laughs> don't tell Joe I said that. All right, so let me, uh, we got about seven minutes left. Why don't I turn over to your guys' questions? Yeah. Okay, so the question was that money that they printed up during the war years, what happened to it? I mean, I, I don't know off the top of my head there. If you look at the official CPI, there was a huge jump in 46 and 47. So you can see it like once they lifted the price controls, things zoomed up. So, I mean, that's, that's part of it. But I, I mean, they didn't, they didn't suck out the monetary base. I mean, you can see they, they just kept it steady for a long time there. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure... Off the top of my head, I don't know exactly where that went, but yeah, I'm sure you could look and see that military contractors did very well in those years. Yep. So you make this point about the 1920. Okay, so the question is with the 1920 and 21 depression, you know, where I'm saying, look at they did the exact wrong wrong policies according to the Keynesians and things were fine. And he wants to know how did the Keynesians respond and then what do I say to that? Uh, so the Keynesians, I know what they say. They'll say these are different. First of all, there wasn't a bank crisis. There wasn't a banking panic in the early 20s. And so that's one big difference. So the economy, 
it wasn't as, uh, as, as vulnerable, right? So the normal things where, oh, if, if spending in one sector falls, well, somewhere else it can rise because prices fall. So that, that mechanism of just being able to bounce back was healthier in the economy back then than during the early 30s or now. And then they also say the reason you had that depression was because of the policies that we're talking about. That it was the end of the war. The reason the Fed jacked up interest rates is because price inflation was really high. It was running at like 20% annually CPI increases at the end of World War I. So, it, so the Fed raised interest rates to tamp down on price inflation. They're going to say that's what caused the crash and then supplemented by the government cutting spending. So, they're, so they would say it's not that, oh, we had this financial crisis that hit us out of nowhere, and then the government and Fed in response did anti-Keynesian things, and it turned out okay. They're going to say no, because they wanted to get inflation under control and they wanted to cut spending because the war was over. That did cause the crisis, but once you know, they got inflation under control or they started letting interest rates fall and, and things went back to normal. So that's, that's what they would say. Um, as far as you know, how do we respond to that? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, you're never going to have a controlled experiment. So the only way we would know for sure is if we could go back to 1930 and have them do Austrian stuff and then see what would have happened. There's always going to be differences, but it depends which particular account you're looking at. Some accounts of why what the Fed did was bad in the 30s just talks about, well, no, because prices fell and that just sets in motion. You know, I'm sure you guys have heard this, like, why is deflation bad? And they say, oh, because if you think prices are going to come down, you're going to wait. You're not going to spend. So, I mean, if that's your explanation as to why deflation is harmful, well, that was true in the 20s also. So, I mean, it's, at the very least, I mean, it's on, uh, wages fell something like 15% or no, 20% in one year in, in 1920 and 21. I think that's partly hot to show prices were falling and wages fell faster. So you, you know it can happen. So the story that, oh, well, we have sticky wages, I mean, that, I think, whatever the reasons, that was shown to be false. So, so it is true that it, not every little thing is the same, but I think a lot of it is the same. Uh, yeah. This will be the last one. Okay, so the question is about the Smoot Hawley tariff, which is made famous, of course, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You know he's talking about that? Um, when a lot of you kids look like the kids in that scene. Um, that is, it is, in a typical sort, of, especially like a, from a free market perspective, when they're trying to explain the Great Depression, they'll point to that. And it is true that in the early 30s, you know, the U.S. passed the Smoot Hawley tariff, jacked up tariff rate. I mean, it was a very huge increase in protectionism, and then other countries around the world followed suit, and so you had a trade war, and if you look at the statistics, international trade plummeted, so a lot of people point to that. And in fact, Jude Winiski, who was like a, a supply sider, he basically blames the, great, the stock market crash of 29 on the Smoot-Hawley tariff, when you might say, well, how is that possible? Because it was in the future, but he's saying when they were debating it, you could see the stock market going, and when it looked like it was gonna pass, the market would tank, and then when it looked like somebody was gonna hold it up, the market would recover. So he was saying that the stock market crash was forward-looking. They anticipated those policy changes. and that's what, I mean, that may all be true, but I, I personally, I think that was more just like kicking the economy when it was down. I mean, I think to me, that'd be like saying Obamacare was the reason that we had the 2008 crisis. And so, yeah, it doesn't help that they did that, kicking the economy was down, but I don't think that was the explanation for what happened. I just think that's partly why it's so sluggish now. Okay, I don't want to get yelled at, so I'm going to stop here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.